You may be seated. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, we are told that prayer is a great privilege. It's a great opportunity. We're encouraged to come before uh, the God of the universe and that he would listen to little old me or little young me or any little in, in between. Uh, what an incredible invitation. And um, I was telling somebody the other day, reminding somebody the other day, of course, God knows our every thought or every motive. You can't run, you can't hide. So when I pray, you can pray along with me. You can certainly lift up other thoughts and prayers in your minds. But it's, it's great, great time to come to the Lord in prayer. Amen? We don't do it enough. Let's, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we humble our hearts this morning. Uh, we have been invited uh, into this place by you. You encourage everyone to come and to bow the knee and to bow the heart and to call upon the name. My Father, I think of the scripture that says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will in no way be disappointed. And Father, thank you uh, this morning uh, that you are the God uh, to fulfill all of our dreams, uh, to give us the abundant life here and now, and how it extends into eternity. And may we capture uh, that thought this morning. Uh, may we be uh, in, enthralled and raptured with that thought, that we would uh, spend all eternity with you, the author and the giver of life, uh, the one who has called us by name, the one who knows all there is to know about us, and the one that bids us to come into your presence this morning. And we, we do that not in our own merits. We do that through the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we don't need a, a, a human high priest, that we don't need a physical sacrifice this morning, that we don't have to come uh, with physical, physical proper dress, uh, tassels and ceremonial things. We come this morning through the ultimate high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, through his work at Calvary. Uh, we come uh, covered in your blood, and we come before your throne of grace boldly, asking you to visit with us this day, asking that you would re-energize our, our hearts and our lives. Uh, for those of us who do feel weary and tired, that you would uh, renew our souls, um, our heart, our minds, our thoughts in such a way where we would be spiritually changed this morning, have a new perspective, um, just uh, spiritually energized as we leave this place. Uh, also, Father, too, uh, thank you that you know every thought, you know every, every need before we even ask whether it's material mental, emotional, spiritual, you know the need, and we pray that you would meet us right where we're at this morning, uh, that uh, we would sense your presence, uh, that we would feel your presence, and that uh, you would touch our hearts in a way where we know that we've been with you. Uh, Father, I want to lift up those uh, that have been listed on the back of the bulletin, uh, for many months, uh, people that have physical ailments, uh, people that are failing physically, um, people that are uh, struggling um, emotionally, mentally, uh, whatever it may be, I lift them up before your throne of grace. Lord, I I struggle to name them all because I know, again, that I probably will miss someone. But we, uh, we lift them up and we pray that you would touch them in a way where they have a renewed sense of hope and purpose and uh, well-being this morning. Yeah, if not physically, in their state of uh, heart and in their mind. Uh, also, Father, too, we lift up our country. Uh, great, great needs, Lord. Uh, we've left you. 
Uh, we see the cracks in the foundation. Uh, we see trouble on the horizon. And uh, we ask that uh, you, as the God of unity, as the one who can only bring peace and unity, that uh, you would forgive us our sins. And somehow, Lord, you would begin a mending of our country. Uh, we pray that our leaders uh, would turn from their wicked ways, um, thinking that uh, things could be done apart from you. Uh, so we, we lift them up this morning. Uh, pray that uh, you would visit uh, Washington in a way where uh, they too would sense your presence. Uh, Father, also I want to lift up uh, all the families that uh, are distraught over the missing loved ones from the building collapse in Miami. Um, as you can only do, uh, we pray that you would use us as a tremendous occasion uh, to promote the gospel, uh, that uh, people would see their need for Jesus, uh, and that you would minister to those hearts and those loved ones that are grieving right now. Uh, we, again, thank you for your presence. Uh, pray that we would know that we've been with you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, no. what? We, we don't have special music. No. Okay. That was an oversight. <laughs> I was going to say, Bob, I didn't know that there was special music. <laughs> Carry over from last week. Okay. No, I'm not doing special music. <laughs> Our first reading this morning is from the 145th Psalm, verses 1 to 7, and it's found on page 566 of the Church Bible. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully, of your righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. This morning's second scripture reading continuing in the Old Testament from the book of the prophet Jeremiah from the first chapter we reading verses 4 through 10. And if you're using a new church Bible, it starts on page 676. In the first chapter of Jeremiah, verses 4 through 10. Jeremiah writes, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build 
and to plant. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, so, so, folks, uh, this morning, uh, Patricia Warren is going to share her testimony. Uh, Patricia, I appreciate you uh, being willing to do so. Uh, we're going to commit this time to prayer, and then, of course, you know I will have some things to say about that afterwards. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, thank you uh, for placing it upon Patricia's heart to share how you have worked in her life and... I pray that you would anoint those words to our hearts today and also uh, what you've laid upon my heart. And so we give you this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So Patricia, it's all yours. I was a little bit nerve-wracked coming up and giving my testimony. I haven't done this in a long time. Um, but the scripture that was read just prior to this really is appropriate. Um, sometimes when God calls you to do something, you just got to go. My testimony, and I'm kind of a visual storyteller, if you want to call it that. This is me in all my darkness. Born an innocent child. You know, God appointed me to be here. Um, but through circumstances, by the time I was 12, I started smoking marijuana. That kind of got me into a whole lifestyle and culture of dealing drugs, smoking weed, taking pills, you name it, it was there. Um, running away from home multiple, multiple, multiple times. Finally, to a point where by the time I was 15, um, I was in so much trouble that the military actually told my father, she has to go, she's nothing but trouble. And um, they shipped me stateside, away from my family for a year. And what do I do? I pick up in the United States and I find the same group of people. And over the course of the year, um, you know, I s smoked a little weed. Most of the people that I was hanging out with, they were kind of country folk and their big thing was drinking, so I introduced them to weed, you know. Um, and then from there I ended up, um, my uncle passed away from a heart attack and my aunt ended up in a um, state hospital from a nervous breakdown after his death. And it was just me and my cousin, 16 years old, running free. Anyways, long story short, I end up going back home. That summer, my father had me right there by his side. He had me working with him. I was a good girl for a whole summer. Got back to school, same crowd. Um, but this time, I ended up picking up heroin. And over the course of the next two years, I end up pretty much with about a $500 a day habit. But to support that habit, you go back into the lifestyle. Dealing drugs, stealing, uh, manipulating, hustling, you name it. Whatever it took to get the drugs. Um, finally graduated. And no jobs where I was, you know, they just reverted the island back to Japan, so it's no, no longer under military control or American control. End up back stateside, hooked up with the same type of people, you know, getting into the heroin scene. Um, unfortunately, the differences in the drugs, or I should say more really fortunately, um, the heroin wasn't getting me high like it would, you know, the purity of it on Okinawa was so much different than here. So then I got into coke and um, ended up getting married. Um, that was marriage number one. So, the, you know, this whole cycle of chaos and just living in darkness and darkness and darkness. Um, I end up... Uh, 
getting to starting the process of the divorce, but I was traveling between New York and California, whole drug scene. In California, it was the Hollywood um, rich and famous lifestyle. The planes, the limos, the, the big money, um, flying back and forth to Mexico. And if you think there isn't a cartel, I got news for you, there is a cartel. Um, and then finally, my girlfriend comes down with cancer and it's terminal. And thank you, Drew. Um, I go back to New York, start filing for the divorce on marriage number one, move to Boston. Who do I hook up with? A corporate drug, druggie, you know? But he had a corporate image. Um, and I, you know, so I'm still in that lifestyle, maintain lifestyle of, you know, um, rich and famous, if you want to call it that. Um, but it turns out to be an abusive relationship. And um, the reason I ended up marrying him was because I got pregnant. And I think it was pretty much, you know, that that's a good telltale sign right there. So after about four or five years of being abused, um, you know, getting choked, um, doing the drugs and everything, my brother gets a vision of me for him to come out because he had gotten saved. He comes out and starts preaching Jesus to me and my first thought was some cult in California got hold of him. You know, he's preaching Jesus and he's running around with the Bible, chasing me around the house, preaching Jesus and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, you gotta get away from me. Um, and then across the street, the house gets sold and a minister and his evangelical kids who were my babysitters move in. And, I'm, and, my, ba and my other babysitter's mother is a Christian who had come through an abusive relationship. And um, it was like God was just setting me up for a drive-by. And uh, that marriage collapsed. Um, but in the end, I had lost so much self-esteem, I was literally, I left my kids, called a babysitter, I was heading to New York, and I was gonna just load up a needle of coke and heroin, and that was gonna be the end of it. I stopped at a friend's house, she said, no, you're not doing that, you know, the whole thing. She convinced me, we ended up getting into um, talking with a woman's shelter, and. Um, Long story short, I end up with my kids. Um, I left the money behind. In the meantime, I get saved. You know, I end up, um, <clears throat> I end up getting saved and the pastor probably took a year and a half to even break through the mistrust that I had for people. And, um, in the, in the salvation, I'm thinking, wow, I know Jesus. You know, you know when you first get saved, what ends up happening? You just shoving it down everybody's throat. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, you can't stop talking about him. But so God lifted my darkness. He took away the drugs and all that dark activity. But I still couldn't see myself, you know? And I'm like, well, who did you make? You know, what's, what's wrong with this picture, God? I'm still not, who am I? You know, and that's when the journey started. I did not like this journey. And when you talk about a spiritual recovery journey, it's not just about the drugs or the alcohol. It's about codependency. It's about uh, enabling. It's about um, uh, so many more issues. And slowly but surely, God touched the little girl that was hit by her father at the age of three, you know, and he dealt with that issue in my life. And then he went and um, dealt with issues of me being molested, um, dealt with issues of abandonment because my father was so abused by my mother that she took off. And um, 
she ended up coming back, but her life was so miserable. And I learned to forgive a lot of things in that time period. Then he comes in and he's healing those reasons that I got married. I've been married three times. <laughs> um, in the process, I married a good Christian man. You know, I met him up at um, Congress. I was working for Billy Graham um, Worldwide Pictures at the time, promoting some of his films. And uh, he came by and, you know, we fell in love. But, you know, I was still doing some of the bad behaviors prior to, you know, me getting saved. I wasn't doing the drugs or anything. And uh, we ended up getting married. It was either like marry or burn, you know, type of a situation. Um, and in the course of time, I find out how legalistic he is. And it became a very rigid Christianity for me, you know. I have to do this, I have to do that. And if I w didn't do this and I didn't do that, then I was not a good Christian. And then it kind of broke me down even spiritually. God ends up, I get divorce number three. You know, I thought, a Christian man? I, I've got it made. Well, it's not always true. You know, sometimes you jump into things without God's permission or his wisdom. And... So through the course of time, I end up getting divorced from him. And at that time, I really honestly thought God had left me. And I kept, I was at a revival thing or whatever down in Providence. And I kept thinking, if this man lays hands on me, everything is going to get fixed. Because I knew God through my emotions. And, you know, I was into that whole charismatic movement and the Pentecostal and um, it was always through the emotions, you know, I could feel it in the music, I could feel it, um, everything was about feelings. And driving home, the guy never laid hands on me. People were falling out in the spirit all over the place. And I finally, I line myself, I'm trying to line myself up with this guy so he would lay hands on me. And he finally comes over, he lays hands on me, everybody around me fell, fell down. And I'm standing there, no feelings whatsoever. I couldn't feel anything. I was totally confused. I'm driving back, bawling my eyes out. And I just heard God in his still, sweet voice say to me, you have known me through your feelings and your emotions. Now you are going to know me in a different way. And it started me on a journey, you know, started me back on that journey of healing and over the course of time, you know, he started healing the issues in the marriages. Started, you know, I pretty much have lost my kids at this point because they're so confused. My kids and I have a good relationship, but it's, I look at my daughter and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's a mini me in the darkness. I look at my son and he's just totally confused. But I also have faith that God is going to do to them what he did to me. Amen. You know, do I want to go in there and fix it? Sure I do. I'm an enabler. I'm a codependent. You know, I'm, I'm all those emotional issues. And so slowly over time, I've been able to forgive a lot of people, my ex-husbands, a lot of people in my life. Um, do I have some... There's a couple people I'm kind of asking God to help me forgive. Um, but basically, I've got a pretty good relationship with most people, and that's the way I want it to be. And I know I'm going to have to confront certain people that eventually I'm going to have to walk the walk. So over the course of time, God starts, he puts me into a three-year healing ministry. Emotional healing that there were nights I would drive into Cambridge every Monday night, and there would be nights when I would be bawling my eyes out because this journey is not easy. Your spiritual recovery is not an easy journey. If you think, oh, I'm a Christian, everything's all fine and good and dandy, I know my scriptures, I got news for you. You need to get in the spiritual recovery group because it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. 
Um, I was talking to Annie just a little bit ago, and I was saying, how did the homework go? It's step one, giving over control. And I was like, I'm having a hard time because I don't, you know, when I first did this, I was talking about, you know, um, sexual promiscuity and, uh, you know, just, um, I knew were sinful issues, you know? And um, she was saying, I'm the same thing. And then we were talking and it was almost like, your, your journey has come to a place where you're trusting him more. I went to a wake, a celebration service last night. I was t telling Jerry. And the guy had a seventh grade, he was a seventh grade dropout, worked on a farm all his life, had a third grade reading level. And he was leading a marriage seminar group. And he knew, he had such humility, he got up and he actually was reading part of the book and some scripture, and he would have to ask his wife, what is that word? Literally like a third grader would. And I saw such humility in that man. And last night when they did his celebration service, people were getting up and telling him, telling everybody about how he gave them such wisdom. Um, you know, with the walks in the woods. He was a hunter and, you know, loved to go out and get his venison, loved to fish. And in those times that he had with people, the wisdom was way beyond his reading skills. And in the end, he ended up with terminal cancer and his granddaughter was um, expecting their first great grandchild, but he was expected to die and they thought he was going to die before this child was born. Anyways, long story short there, three o'clock in the afternoon, he meets his granddaughter the day after she's born. He goes to bed and he goes home to the Lord that night. But the testimonies of the wisdom and the love and the humility that this man had was just unbelievable. And then the pastor said, his faith in the end was stronger than in the beginning. And that's what this whole spiritual journey is about. It's to develop your faith. My number one addiction, I'm going to be real honest with you, is fear. I, Jerry wanted me to do this testimony probably two years ago. You know, I was like, oh, no way. You know, these people are going to judge me, you know, the whole thing. Um, which is not true. It's just my fear. And I've walked in fear for so long that, you know, I want to be able to say when, when I go, I want somebody to say her faith was stronger in the end than in the beginning. Because I still have a lot of fear issues. But that spiritual journey, as God continues to heal, he's revealing to me the girl that he created. Not that I created, not that, you know, my husband's created, not that my children created, not that my addictions created, but me, the way God created me. And that's who I want to become. It is a journey. It's a tough journey. But if any of you have any kind of, you know, like fear, this journey is definitely worth it. And I would highly recommend that if you want to, you know, see a different you, you want to see, you know, your church grow. You know, I, this is my belief. God did not come to, trans, to fix the church. He came to transform each one of us because we're the church. This building is nothing, okay? It's a good representation and everything, but he didn't come to fix this. He came to fix this, Amen. that heart, you know? And I'll tell you, the spiritual journey is one way to get there. So I thank you. And um, hopefully this will get me off the stage. <laughs> thank you. Uh, as you heard, testimonies are biblical. They're powerful. They're inspirational. And a lot of times we get into this mindset where in this mental rut or spirit, where we just don't know where to go and we don't know how to find our way out. And yet, when you hear something like that, it gives you hope, doesn't it? It reminds us that God 
<laughs> he's got it all figured out. He knows what he's doing. He, he can take care of it. And, and, you know, they have, testimonies have huge impact. Uh, I sat here um, because, Patricia, you took me back, you know, about 40-some years ago to my situation, you know, and maybe you were taken back. Uh, but it kind of brought a couple of tears to my eyes, you know? And I don't like to cry, <laughs> especially in front of people. Um, I want this to be encouraging and challenging. I got three questions for you this morning. When was the last time? And if it convicts you, then so be it. But when was the last time you shared your testimony in coming to Christ with somebody? When was the last time you told somebody, hey, I had this born-again experience, I met Jesus Christ, and I'm sharing him with you, so you can too. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you shared about how God was working in your life? Uh, whether it be in a church venue, or in a work venue, or some other place. When was the last time you actually shared the gospel with an unbeliever? Now here's the problem, is church folk a lot of times hang around with church folk. But we do come across unbelievers, don't we? All the time. So when was the last time you actually shared the gospel, Christ, scriptures, with an unbeliever? Now, again, uh, I want to encourage you and challenge you to think on that. I, I'm not trying to condemn or make anybody go on a guilt trip, right? Just want you to, to let that kind of germinate. There's a difference between testimony and gospel, sharing the gospel. Patricia shared her testimony. God was in that, but she didn't necessarily share the gospel. There's a, there's a big difference. I make that distinction. You know, when, when we talk about, you know, the gospel, sharing the gospel, we think of Mass evangelism, Billy Graham crusade, Franklin Graham crusade, this event, that event, Rainham Pride Day, setting up a booth or whatever. When was the last time you actually thought about how your testimony and your one-on-one -on -one sharing is more high impact and more dynamic and more transformational than a Billy Graham or a Franklin Graham crusade. A Billy Graham, forget Billy Graham. Billy Graham's not doing any more crusades. Franklin Graham, or any sort of evangelist. You know, we, we forget, don't we? We forget that word of mouth is hugely transformational. You just heard it this morning. We forget that, and, and every single one of us has a tremendous testimony. No, it's not the same. No, it's not cookie cutter. But what's tremendous is that God met each and every one of us, hopefully, where we've been at, and he's brought us to a place where we would never have been if we didn't meet him. And that's the beautiful thing. And it's a very, very special testimony. And that testimony that you have goes out in many, many different ways to different hearts of people that you know. You know, um, you know, we talk about, like, you know, growing the church. Uh, churches are like the businesses in that they grow word of mouth. I, I was talking to Carol Corliss. Her husband had a business. His business grew word of mouth. I have the courier business. Business grows word of mouth. I mean, yeah, you, make, you might make a sales call here and there, but, but for the most part, it, it, you know, it, it, people say, oh, you so-and-so. It, it just kind of just germinates and, you know, just kind of mushrooms out. That's how it works. And, and it works because people, you know, with business, they're excited that, you know, maybe you do something well, or you're honest, you have integrity, trustworthiness. But when you talk about sharing the gospel and church is growing, it's because people are excited about what God is doing in their life. And they know that God's word doesn't return void. And they're excited to share. You know, I, I was thinking, um, John chapter 1, when was the last time you read? Remember, remember uh, God finds, uh, uh, Andrew is one of John uh, the Baptist's disciples. So Andrew uh, finds his brother because he finds Messiah and he tells Peter, right? And then Philip finds Nathaniel 
He tells Nathaniel about the Messiah, and, and it kind of just mushrooms out that way. John chapter 4, woman at the well. You know the story. What does she do? She finds the Messiah, and she runs down, and she tells the whole town. Great evangelist. The, most, the single most factor is people sharing their testimony with what God has done in their life and their heart. That's how it happens. Now, it's all relational. Patricia and I were talking about the earlier in the week. You know, trying to build relationships with community, with the community, it's, that's huge. But listen, listen, I was thinking about this. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a mathematician, you know that. I'm not a numbers guy. My, my wife is the numbers girl. You want, you want some numbers done? She can calculate numbers, okay? But if all of us have at least 50 relationships that where we're talking about where people don't go to church, 50 relationships, I think most of us have that. You And you take, what, 40, maybe 50 people. Let's keep it simple, 50. You've got 2,500 lives that are touched simply in that way if we share Christ with our friends and family. 50 here and 50 go out. 50 messages, to, a message go out to 50 different hearts. That's 2,500 people. But if you and I have 100 people in our relationships then that's 5,000. And if we have 150, that's 7,500. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that that's going to be way more effective than bringing in Franklin Graham down to the Citerion Theater or something. Because most of the time with those evangelism venues, mostly Christians go. So uh, what I'm stressing here is the the impact of your testimony in the lives of people that you know, that don't go to church, that are unsaved. God can do, and he will use you, whether you think it or not. So when was the last time you shared your testimony? Think about that. Pray about that. Uh, you know, the testimony, Patricia's, where she was at, where he met her, what God had done over the years, where he brought her to, what he's currently doing, that's the testimony. That's, that's what it is. It, it involves sharing his love, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, your spiritual journey. That, that should come naturally. You know, you don't necessarily need, you know, notes and notes and a cue card with something like that because you've lived it. Listen, listen to this. This is testimony right out of Scripture. Uh, Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2. David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear to me. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. That's literally the, the mud of the mire. Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. Uh, this is Nebuchadnezzar, by the way. Daniel chapter 4, verse 2. It says, It seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and his mighty, uh, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar. So, you know, your, your personal testimony is experiential. It's transformational, it's living and active, and it must always lead to the Lord Jesus Christ. Must always do that. Now, here you go. Uh, John, the disciple. Uh, John, uh, 1 John 1, verse 1. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld in our hands, handle concerning the word of life. John's testimony led to Christ. Psalm 105, verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his, dis, de, his deeds among the peoples. Psalm 22, verse 22, I will tell of thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise thee. Patricia just did that. Psalm 35, verse 28, My tongue shall declare thy righteousness and thy praise all day long. So when you take a look at the scriptures, 
personal testimony. It's word of mouth that draws people. That's how I accepted Christ ultimately. Somebody invited me to a Bible study in church. I stressed the verbal part of the testimony, but how about the living part, the lifestyle part? You know what, you know what we have today, and Patricia and I were also talking about this. We have a lot of people who talk about following Jesus, but they're not necessarily a disciple of Jesus. And so when you talk about the, the verbal part is one thing, the lifestyle's quite the other. And you know the scriptures, but what does Paul say to the Corinthians? He talks about how they're living epistles. That's what he says. So what we say and what we do are so, so very important. Uh, the way we live, it's letting him live, letting him shine, and letting him share. That's what it is. You know, Think about it. When, when we don't share, we're actually shutting him down from sharing his life with others. That's what it is. As living epistles, we're not perfect. We're not perfected. That's why we're living. And so chapters and verses are being written every single day for the purpose of sharing. That's what it is. Very quickly, take a look at Jeremiah. Motorcycles. Lots of them. <laughs> Jeremiah. Um, there are several principles I want to highlight here in this passage, very quickly, okay? But first, what I want to say is this. When you read this, you say, oh, this is about Jeremiah the prophet. Uh, this is about preachers. No, it's not. Its interpretation is about Jeremiah and a preacher and a prophet. But ultimately, by way of application, you and I need to own this passage of Scripture. This is about Jeremiah's calling, but it's also ultimately about every believer's calling. When we received God as our Savior, we were commissioned to share the good news about our Savior. That's the way it works. Principle number one here, like Jeremiah, you and I have been appointed to share God and his word with others. That principle comes out of this text here. Uh, God has ordained our lives in Christ before the foundation of the world. Ephesians, let me read Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Therefore, by extension, you and I have been appointed to speak and to share. Now, with Jeremiah, did you notice here... Um, it was, and actually, the word appointed occurs in verse 5. It also occurs in verse 10. It's like bookends. God has bookended this passage for you and me to understand that we've been appointed to that end. Appoint, Jeremiah was appointed before birth, before the womb. That's because he was chosen before the foundation of the world, before God ever did anything. He had Jeremiah in mind before God ever saved you. He had you and me in mind. That's how it works, okay? And that day of being appointed also is fulfilled when we bow our heads and we say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. That's when you're commissioned. And, and as I look at this text here, sharing's not optional. Every believer has been appointed to speak of the glories of Christ. That, that's why I asked those three questions. When was the last time you did that? Second principle, uh, we feel severely inadequate for the task. Uh, that's the reality of it. No one feels adequate. If you feel adequate, probably not prepared anyway. But uh, I, just about every single believer that I know who is in ministry... 
The gospel ministry or any believer that sits in the pew has always felt inadequate to share and speak on behalf of God. Take a look at verse 6. What does Jeremiah say? I don't know how to speak. That's a common concern with just about every believer if they're honest with themselves. You know, uh, we almost think that we have to have great oratory skills, maybe take a public speaking course or something. It's so far from the truth. All you have to do is have a desire to share the love of Christ your Savior. Uh, what did the Apostle Paul say? Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. Let me read this for you. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and preaching were not in per persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and the power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. What the Apostle Paul was saying here is that he relied on the Spirit of God when he spoke. He didn't trust his knowledge and his wisdom and, you know, his great oratory skills. Point number three, principle number three. Uh, we're all great at making excuses, aren't we? Well, I didn't share because. I didn't feel comfortable because. I don't really want to because of that. Uh, <laughs> what, do, what does he say? Uh, I'm young. God, I can't really do it because I'm young. Um, good at making excuses. Uh, why we can't share, why we're not capable of sharing, why we're not able to share, well, you know, somebody came in, or somebody did this, or somebody said that. You know, uh, this, is, this is funny, but not funny, ironic. Do you know Moses? Great Moses. You know the situation with Moses, right? He came up with all sorts of excuses as to why he couldn't speak for God. Uh, I'm not an eloquent man, he said, I'm, and not a man of words. Um, I'm slow of speech. Uh, my tongue is heavy. Maybe he had a stuttering, right? Uh, verse 12, please send someone else. <laughs> you know what the scripture says? God got angry with the excuses. Got angry. Uh, just as an aside here, <laughs> I have similar excuses. Um, you know, I go back uh, to my experience. God, I'm young. Uh, God, I don't know much. Uh, Patricia, the fear was there. Just like the Apostle Paul, fear was there. Uh, Jeremiah, he's got fear. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, the eloquent thing wasn't there. You know, I'm from the streets of Philadelphia, right? I'm not articulate. Uh, lousy student in grade school and high school. Real lousy. <laughs> Lousier than you will know. Uh, I even pulled the hypocrisy card. God, I, I, I can't preach because I'll be a hypocrite. What, what did God say to Moses and Jeremiah? He says, I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what to say. And that applies to each and every one of us. So there's no excuses. And we're, just, we're just the instrument, the messenger, right? God gives the message. We're just the messenger. Now, now I know what you're thinking, right? What did they do to the messenger? They shoot the messenger, they kill him, right? <laughs> That's generally true. I understand that. I think you understand that. That simply reinforces the next principle of fear. Because Jeremiah, God says here in verse 8, Jeremiah doesn't say that he's afraid, but God knows he's afraid. Verse 8, he says, do not be afraid of them. God knew Jeremiah's heart. God knows the fear that paralyzes us. And, you know, that fear is alive and well, right? I mean, you know, especially today. You know, you don't know what people are going to do. We're all going to die. If, if there, I'd rather die in my sleep, but if I had another option apart from sleep, it would be 
preaching the gospel or sharing Christ, and then somebody takes me out because they didn't like the message. That would be a good way to go, too. I'm okay with that. God says, don't be afraid. I, I am with you, verse 9 here. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yep, verse, verse 9. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 8. I, I am with you, I will deliver you. Uh, God told Joshua not to be afraid. Jesus told the disciples not to be afraid. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was actually thinking, you know, we ought to be afraid to not not go, right? In other words, we ought to be afraid to not share when God tells us to share. Remember Jonah, right? Time doesn't allow me to talk about Jonah. But Jonah was, uh, um, Jonah thought that he could run from the task, right? Didn't work too well. Principle number six here. This is so precious. Verse nine. He touched me. He touched me. He touched my heart, my mind, my mouth, my feet, my hands. Did, didn't that come out of Patricia's testimony this morning? That's, that's a person who's been transformed. Not by, you know, self-improvement stuff. He touched me. He touched her so she could touch others. He touched me so I could touch others. He's touched you so you could touch others. That's how it works. I just didn't wander into a church in a Bible study myself, folks. Somebody gave me an invitation. That's how it works. And it leads to the sharing of the gospel. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You hear a testimony of how God's transformed, but now let's talk about Christ and his word because people need to understand how they're alienated from the life of God, they're separated, they're under judgment, but Christ has solved that problem. That's sharing the gospel. So your testimony is like setting the table but Christ, the bread of life, is the meal. That's who we serve up. I was talking to somebody earlier in the week, and they brought up the Daily Bread devotional. I don't know if you read the Daily Bread devotional, but uh, on the 24th of this past week, I think it was like Wednesday or Thursday, um, it was entitled Sharing Your Faith, and it was written by uh, Amy um, boucher Pie, And um, she talked about how an evangelist, as this, this evangelist longed to share the gospel with somebody who was doing her nails, you know. I guess she had her nails done on a regular basis. And she looked for opportunity after opportunity. And, and she was struggling. This is an evangelist, right, struggling to share the good news. Well, she prays about it. And she finds opportunity through various circumstances Grab a dip deli a dip of bread if you haven't read it. And she, and, and, and she struggles to share, but God opened up a door. She shares the gospel with this lady, Heather, and she finds out that Heather moves her shop when, when she came back from, I guess, being on a trip or something. But the lady was finally so captivated to hear about how someone else found Christ. And, and so this evangelist had the opportunity to share. She prayed. She struggled. She prayed. God gave her the right moment, the right words, the open door. And, and, and God will do that. If you, if you have a burden for somebody on your heart, then God will do that. I, I'm going to close with this question. If we have the living Christ the Holy Spirit living within, and we do as believers, how can we fail if we are trusting him to speak through us? Folks, I got to get up here every single Sunday, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. How do you think I do this? I, I by the way, I said this years ago, I could actually buy sermons online. I could spend a couple hundred dollars 
and get 52 sermons for the whole year. I don't do that. My wife knows I don't, don't do that. I'll never do that. How do, you, how do you think I do this? How do you think Patricia did it this morning? You know, that was a lot of background stuff. She did it through the power of God. I do it, hopefully, through the power of God. God will give you the right words if you just simply ask him. It's your, it's your testimony. It should be so natural, be like water off a duck's back. It should just flow. And, 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 and you've been in the church long enough, under at least my teaching ministry, long enough to know the gospel of your salvation. Amen? You're not without that knowledge to share the gospel with friends, your, your good friends who don't know God, your good neighbors who don't know God, your, your, your good family members who don't know God. I, I, you know, um, I, I think we will be pleasantly surprised uh, if we pray about it, uh, we ask him for great opportunity. Um, I think God will do some tremendous things. Uh, he'll give you the right words. Anyway, that's what God has laid upon my heart uh, between Patricia and me. I don't know how long we've, we've spoken this morning, but uh, it's all good. Amen. Uh, I in challenge you and encourage you. Uh, I don't want to condemn you. I, I ask those questions this morning uh, to your heart and go out. Take the good news and share it. Uh, what's a disco Discover commercial? Share the good news. Spread it wide. <laughs> Cashback people? No. Gospel people, right? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you uh, for your message, uh, your Savior, uh, that resonates uh, the world over. Uh, as Nebuchadnezzar said, um, your kingdom's an everlasting kingdom from one generation to another. And uh, Father, thank you that we've been recipients of the good news of the gospel of Christ. Uh, may we put away our fears. May we put away our excuses. May we trust you uh, to give us the right words, the right moment, the right opportunity. May we uh, commit this to prayer. And may we understand that we've been appointed to that end. Uh, we thank you for Patricia opening her heart and sharing of the glories of Christ and the wonderful things that you have done. Uh, thank you for the tremendous healing that you've uh, brought to her heart or bringing to her heart and to uh, continuing to bring to each and every one of us uh, our hearts as well. Uh, we bless you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.